Hi, everybody, and thanks for listening. This is Richard Miller in the Plangier Culture Lab at Rutgers University. On today's episode of Time with a Creative Mind, I'll be speaking with James Scott, professor of political science and anthropology at Yale University and author of Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed, The Art of Not Being Governed, An Anarchist History of Upland Southeast Asia, and Domination in the Arts of Resistance, Hidden Transcripts. When I came up with the idea for this interview series, which is meant to help advanced writers think about creativity and curiosity in the composing process, James Scott was one of the first people who came to mind as someone to speak with. His work, Domination in the Arts of Resistance, was a pivotal influence on my own thinking when I was in graduate school. And I've always admired him as someone who's able to write both within his discipline and to interested readers from other disciplines. I hope you enjoy the conversation. You've gone from uh, Weapons of the Week. Uh, You really have the uh, talent for the best titles, I have to say. Weapons of the Week, Dominations in the Arts of Resistance, Seeing Like a State, and then you just told me the, the next one, which is how to... The Art of Not Being Governed. The Art of Not Being Governed. I, it, those are, each one of those titles is so suggestive of a, of a project that, is, uh, that isn't simply a recounting, but is in fact articulating a way of seeing, mm-hmm. and a way of seeing that is not seeing like a state, right? So can you talk about that? How do you get to the point where we were talking about in relation to the Yves Bertrand uh, Earth from Above photos, that, that what you get when you see from above and you, you, you see the world in ways that you can't see it otherwise and that's enabling, but, but in seeing like a state, you've, you've looked at also that that's how the state sees. It gets from above and it sees who's where mm-hmm. and begins to localize them and constrain them. But clearly in writing those books, you're also very interested in what it means to escape being seen. Well, I'd like to, first something about the titles. It's not, yeah. it's not as if I have a title and then go right No, down. no, I know. <laughs> uh, weapons of the week, what can I do with this? Right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and in fact, none of these books had a title. Uh, until the very end. And in fact, yeah. you know, the book that's coming out in September, it didn't have a title until um, maybe a week ago. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, since every book has its own organic way of becoming uh, not exactly the child you expected it's, it to be, right? Yes. Uglier and more beautiful, or, or sometimes more beautiful <laughs> in ways that you hadn't anticipated. Uh, so, after I finish a book, usually long after I finished a book and with a publisher saying you get a title in the next week or we're going to murder you, um, I then think about a title and I actually start with a huge piece of paper, maybe six feet long, and free associate every term that's in the book that seems relevant, try different titles, uh, and spend a whole day Mm -hmm. doing that. And, uh, you know, usually three or four of those, and uh, most of it's just trash, um, and four or five of those titles end up being finalists, if you like, right. right? And then I run them by other people and see how much they laugh at, um, at them, and uh, maybe they like one or two, and then those are the sort of finalists. We probably shouldn't spend so much time talking about titles, but there are two kinds of titles that, um, that, that serve two functions. Some titles bring you to the book. I think Domination in the Arts of Resistance might bring you to the book. Yeah. Um, and some titles make sense only after you've read the book. So Seeing Like a State, it seems to me, is that kind of title. After you've read the book, you could say, I know why that's called Seeing Like a State, yeah. but yeah. the couple books says Seeing Like a State, what the hell could this be about? Right. Right. And so, um, and I'm, I think it's a better thing, like Weapons of the Week, it's better to have a title that brings you to the book, right? Yeah. And so I think Seeing Like a State, not, uh, it turned out okay, but it's not the best, uh, not the best kind of title. Can we go back to those 
six feet sheets of paper because when we were talking earlier, it's it's not just the titles because what what struck me in your description of your writing process is is that little observation that you're saying and then how you moved out to a book. So I, I think people would be fascinated to hear uh, how you right. start. I mean, I love the fact that that you describe titles as coming well after the process because that's actually not how we teach writing. We say you know what you're going to say and then you write it down and you prove it and then right. you're done. And that's to say you already know what the title is, but in fact, through this whole process, you're coming to understand what it is you're writing about. Right. Once you have a little idea that um, if, if what you're doing is just reading mainstream political science, if you have an idea and you then pursue it and just read mainstream political science, you are going to reproduce mainstream political science because right. it's the same, whatever's coming in, that's it's what's going to be coming out, out right? right? right. Uh, and if, uh, it seems to me that, that if you have a theme or an idea, then what you ought to be doing is at least half of the stuff that you ought to be reading are things outside your field. So if it's about resistance, then read some good novels about resistance. Read uh, accounts of uh, slave narratives. Yeah. Read uh, worker wildcat strike narratives. Uh, read sociology uh, about labor protests and so on. So that the idea is that you have this core idea and you actually, chances are the number of ideas that come from within your discipline, both everybody knows and they're stale and they're not very interesting. And it's only by exploiting that penumbra of things that are about this theme from very different perspectives that you're going to get a fresh eye, a fresh view of these things. And so I actually find that the, at least for me, the path to what I think of as perhaps a fresh view or a new idea comes almost never from within my discipline, but comes from reading ancillary things that people will say, oh, you know, an historian will say, oh, you should read about this, I'll pick that up. Sometimes it works, sometimes uh, it doesn't. So the, the what, Catholic small c uh, <laughs> reading, it seems to me to be crucial. I happen, I think there are dozens and dozens of ways to be a good writer, and I don't think, uh, and everybody has their idiosyncrasies, and I have my idiosyncrasies, and so, at one level, I'm a hopeless anal compulsive um, in the sense that whatever I read, I take notes on. And I mean almost whatever I read. So I'll be taking notes on parts of the New York Times if I find something particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. And I keep, in a sense, an intellectual notebook uh, on a particular theme that I'm interested in. And it piles up and piles up. And it has a lot of ideas. Again, most of us are trash. I have a stack of notes that I've taken on books that, that's got to be at least this high. It serves me well when I have to give a lecture. I can fish out the ones I want and I can put a lecture together in 15 or 20 minutes if I have to. But it, when I go to write, I go through all of those and fish out all the things that I think are relevant. I then have pieces of butcher paper, you could say, yeah. that are um, at least 12 feet long. Uh, I can actually roll them up and take, put them in a tube and take them with me. After I've thought carefully about some of the big ideas, I'll put the big ideas all across this big fat piece of paper and I'll start writing down the, the books and citations that seem relevant to that. And then I'll realize connections with a sort of felt pen. I'll, it ends up looking like a very bad piece of abstract art by the time <laughs> I'm, I'm through. Or it looks, and it also gets to be so crowded that it looks something like, as we said, who's the, the man, a brilliant mind, who right. just went completely nuts. And, uh, Fills so every have, available space. Exactly, I have this paper filled, uh, filled with things. The other thing is mm. that I do not like to read my own writing after I've written it. So I actually spend a lot of time, often I write with a pencil and an eraser, and I write each sentence maybe two or three times. Uh, because I don't want to see the sentence again after I've, I don't want to go back to it, or I want to go back to it as little as possible. And so I work hard uh, producing a first draft. So if I produce a page a day or two, two pages a day, I'm ecstatic. Um, but I don't do a whole lot of rewriting. If I rewrite, it's, I'm throwing out whole sections that turned out to be a waste of time or something like that. 
Well, I, I'm fascinated by the, the butcher paper that it's so visual that you've, mm. writ you've written so much about how we see and your writing practice is, is a way of, of making your thoughts visible, literally, and drawing out those connections. Right. It, it, and what's striking to me about that is, is the institutionalized way of teaching writing would look at that and say, well, that's a mess, right? But in fact, that's thought, and we teach the outline, the thesis, as if you'd already figured well, it all out, right? right? And ah, um, right. so uh, I, I just think it's, it's fascinating that you've, you've developed a way that allows the writing to serve as a technology for advancing right. thought. One way of writing uh, in a way that engages a reader is to, at the very beginning, have a condensing uh, anecdote story that's rich and yet is gripping and introduces the reader to basically your, your major idea. So, I mean, you could, in fact, read the first eight pages of Seeing Like a State and you'd get the idea mm -hmm. of what uh, the book is about, essentially. Well, that's one of the things that's fascinated me about your writing and, and why I wanted to put it in front of undergraduates is because of the, the way in which you model the, that story has a role to play in life of the mind, but it is not in itself the life of the mind. That, that you you use stories to pull people into, or as you say, stage the encounter with the idea. Mm -hmm. I was struck when we were speaking earlier, though, that, that you're also um, like the best storytellers and the best thinkers. It, you get tired of telling the same story, and so you were talking about uh, what you did after seeing like a state, mm -hmm. and I... I can you can you talk more about you finished this major book, which for for many academics that would be their crowning moment, uh, a real contribution to political science, a major statement, clearly a major book, and yet you don't retire to the lecture circuit or or, or put your pencil down for the last time. You you decided you were going to learn Burmese. At yeah. fifty something, I would assume, right? And which, cognitively, we know to try and take on a language at that late yes. age is an incredible, uh, real right. challenge. This right? may have the net effect just of the freshness of a new project when your mind is open. You haven't narrowed it down. We talked about what I consider uh, when you're about to finish a book, or in the last, let's say, eight months of writing a book, or a year or so, you're picking up other books for what you can pull out of them. Uh, for your book, so it's a kind of exploitative reading. So you're not interested in the book, you're interested in what the little nuggets you can use for whatever it is that you're baking. And the great pleasure of having finished a project and not having quite settled on a new project, I'm interested in rivers and deltas now. Well, I'm going to read about the 1927 Mississippi flood, I'm going to read about the Niger Delta, I'm going yeah. to read about Amazon, Amazonia, and I'm just going to let it you know, to pursue that metaphor, I'm just going to float on the waves downstream of all these great rivers for about six months and read books for the pleasure of where they're going to take me, and I'll be taking notes. But I treasure this period when I haven't narrowed it down, uh, and it's not clear to me what's relevant to read and what's not relevant to mm -hmm. read. Some things might be. So, and I know that a year or two hence, when I have a book project lined up, if I do, that I'll start doing the exploitive reading again. I, w I wanted also to say that for social scientists, most of what we write ought to correspond to some observable phenomenon in people's lives, in, mm -hmm. in students' lives. So, for example, I've taught uh, Powerlessness and Dependency, which I call, which is the book, the Domination of the Arts of Resistance, I, is part of that syllabus. So I teach undergraduates, and I, I tell them the title of the course. I don't even give them a syllabus. And I say, if you want to be in this course, I want you to write me an account, anonymous if you like, of the most striking experience of powerlessness or dependency that you've ever had, mm -hmm. how it made you feel, how it developed, how it turned out, uh, and so on. What do you imagine many of them write about? Sexual relations, I mean, so. 
Well, and it's, alcohol. It's very good, actually. Most people don't get this. I think they, they're, they're writing about their parents or something. It's no. 35% of them write about unrequited love. And they understand something, you know, that, it, that is to say, it's a banal situation. Everyone has experienced it. But, you know, they understand right away that if, in a case of unrequited love, if you are in love with someone and they don't care whether you live or die, you find yourself trying to be the person you think that person would love, mm -hmm. right? And you become inauthentic in an effort to please them and the way in which, in a sense, they're looming over your shoulder, they're determining what you say, you're reading the signals of their pleasure and displeasure. And they understand the way in which you become an inauthentic person in, uh, actually, there are a good many cases of date rape as well that sure. to come into these usually anonymous stories. But the fact is that this class begins really well is my experience has been because people actually already have a kind of insight or have tried to work their way to an insight about situations like this in their own life that are analogous, maybe not so severe, but analogous to the situations about which they'll be reading so they can, in a sense, transport themselves back and forth between these two things. I love that because it's also a teaching story that's about how you use stories to get students to the ideas, right? right. Um, and I, that's just that's just beautiful. What, what happens on the other side? I mean, you, you start them there. Where are you trying to get them at the end of the course? Do they do, they do a, a similar kind of personal writing, or are they into research at that point? Or, or? I actually, the reason, although I'm not a card-carrying anthropologist, the reason I have anthropology envy is that I actually think that the close observation of anything in the world will pay tremendous dividends if you just simply pay absolutely rapt and and persistent attention to it. So, you know, E. O. Wilson as a little boy was interested in ants and yes, he kept he was. looking at ants yes. and kept yeah. following ants and they learned a whole hell of a lot about ants. Well I think that's true about anything. So um, in my boredom and political science department meetings, I've decided I'm an anthropologist with the political science department. I have 80 pages of ethnographic notes on the tribe known as political science <laughs> at Yale. And I may write something about that. I just do it because I'm bored. But the, the So I try to convince my students to do field work in this class and to do something that will force them to encounter a world they're not familiar with and to encounter it in a sustained and careful and persistent way. So for example, what, this is a student who was during spring vacation, he decided he would live with the homeless in Albuquerque. And he happened to have broken his leg in intramural sports. Uh, and so he could plausibly claim to be an alcoholic who had broken his leg in a fall. Right. And so he lived with the homeless for two weeks, essentially. And he wrote, uh, but he really did it paid close attention, and he, and he learned two things that I'll never forget. One of them, he spent a week following around someone who uh, lived from dumpsters and sold things from dumpsters, often industrial dumpsters uh, in Albuquerque. And he understood this person had to defend his right to control that dumpster as yes. private property. He also knew when copper, was, uh, which was valuable then, uh, was delivered when fresh food came from pizza joints uh, and so on. He realized at the end of the week that this this alcoholic homeless man he was with was an urban hunter and gatherer who had the kinds of skills that you know an Amazonian forager would have about the trees in the jungle yeah. of the Amazon. He and and he came out with a tremendous amount of admiration for the kinds of skills that it takes to make a living this way. The other thing he learned is that drug dealers in Albuquerque, they can, the, the dangerous part of drug dealing is making deliveries. And so the, the well-to-do uh, higher up drug uh, runners don't want to be out on the street delivering, and they want to—they want to find people who will do this for them, who were exposed, and so they use the alcoholics and drug addicts uh, in the homeless shelter to deliver drugs because the Albuquerque police know these people, and they—you know—they can be seen on the street any time of night, and the police don't bother them much, 
And they also know that if these people decide to take the drugs and to sell them and keep the money, they can be beaten to within an inch of their life and nobody cares either. So they're like a disposable proletariat. So here on the basis of two weeks, remember this guy had, I thought, the basis for a novel, for uh, an incredible appreciation of the skills, and it was just by being there, paying attention every day, morning till night, watching what these people were doing. Right? He, he threw himself at it. He had terrific results. It's striking to me that that's uh, the immersive experiential aspect, uh, which, however powerful the mind is, the encounter with difference of the realm of ideas is very different from that kind of immersive encounter. Right, right. Um, so I, I'm struck by that, but, I, but before I follow that thread out, I, I, it, is the way that you avoid being seen, um, the way that the homeless forager gatherer, is that a way of not being seen um, that, that your work is concerned with? Or, or is it, or is it um, a much more uh, self-conscious uh, political movement that's about not being seen? Oh, well, I'm interested in, in, in the book. My argument, I'm talking about a huge area of mountain people in between Southeast Asia and India and southwestern China. And they're all considered to be primitive peoples uh, who never figured out wet rice cultivation, never entered Buddhism, never, right? They're considered our living ancestors, what we were like before we became, became civilized. And my argument, uh, and I think I can prove it more or less, is that if we take a 2,000 year perspective, these are people who ran away from states because of conscription, wars, disease, forced labor, and so mm. on. And we ought to see the way in which they live, the form of agriculture that they practice, and so on, as forms of escape. Uh, from states and preventing states from happening. Uh, so these are, if you like, uh, since everybody lives in states these days, these are, this is the history of the people who got away, right? Uh, and still, you know, the Inuit, uh, the, there are still a good many of these people around, but their days are more or less numbered. Um, and so this is an effort to understand the last great um, collection of people who have not yet been absorbed successfully into states. You've had, there's a persistent uh, or consistent interest in uh, anarchy that's, that's driven or been evident in your work from, from the very beginning. And it, um, so it makes sense to me that on the other side of this project is possibly something that's about, and is it anarchy as a, a philosophical position or a practice? I, I would expect that it would be a practice on the ground. I'm now being quasi facetious, but uh, I, I argue that we all should do our anarchist calisthenics, that, that one day we will be called on, as for example in the, in the civil rights movement, we will be called on to break a big law, mm -hmm. and everything will depend on it, and we have to be ready. And we won't be ready unless we stay in shape. And so you must break a small law every day or two just to sort of, you know, jaywalking, Prepare, jaywalking right. whatever, right? Small, to remain in shape for that moment when uh, breaking the law will be, yeah. you know, the Germans could have used with, uh, could have um, would have been well served with a few more uh, right. law breakers. So to see, so to see Germans late at night when there's no traffic, waiting for the traffic light to change before they cross the street is to say, oh my God, right? right. Um, this I'm always being thing. watched by the state, in part, right? I mean, there's there's that sense. Well, and they watch one another. Of course, right. yeah. They, you know, they scold, you know, depending on how confident I was feeling of my German <laughs> at the time, I would cross, but I'd always get scolded. Mm -hmm. uh, so. and, and I associate it with our culture's designation of print as primary. Um, and so all of those things that you were describing sure, sure. as ways of, you know, other ways of being intelligent, um, if you can't corkscrew yourself into the world that's controlled by print, you show up as being a non-functional, non-strong right, right, member. Right. Um, and, and your mountain people, uh, my guess is their education isn't driven by print. Right, right. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. In fact, my argument about 
all the people in, who live in the hills of Southeast Asia, almost all of them have a story about how we once had writing and books and texts, and my guess is that 1,200 years ago or so, they did. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that is to say a small portion of them, because the literate minority would have been a tiny sliver of any society then, and that my argument is that as near as I can tell, these people found that when they were moving away from the lowland valley centers that it was more advantageous to have an oral culture, uh, to be able to reinvent their genealogy, their tribal history, and their movements because it's more plastic, more flexible, they had to adapt themselves to radically new conditions from time to time, and having a text which stays fixed and you can measure in a sense deviations from it, it creates yes. a kind of orthodoxy. If you don't have that text, then you have a lot more play in the world. You can move, right? If we go to the, the classic American text on the river, right, with Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. Oh, right, right? Or Life on you the know, Mississippi right? Yeah, with Huck and Jim on the river. They learn how to navigate together experientially. And one of the ways that the university could productively change, I would say, is to imagine teachers as the guides on these uncharted rivers. Because because we're all going to drown in this information. I mean, you know, once, once the entire world becomes Alexandria Library 2.0, where everything that's ever been printed is available, how do you find anything? In fact, you can't find anything. You know, I don't know if you remember, this is not Huck Finn, but it's life on the Mississippi, in which, uh, being a river pilot, yes. Twain says that before he was a river pilot, he learned to appreciate the water just as, as an aesthetic surface, and the beauties of the landscape, the way you'd appreciate a beautiful flower just for its color and shape, uh, and so on. And after he was a river pilot, every mark on the water meant a shoal, a danger, a sandbank, yes, a right. tide, yeah. and so on. And that he, by having Zen in the Art of Mordecai's yes, Motorcycle yes. Maintenance Point as well, yeah. that at that point he had lost, the, by becoming a skilled navigator, he had lost, in a sense, the aesthetic charm for surfaces yes. that he had as a naive viewer. My other favorite scene in Life on the Mississippi is where he's, he's told he has to memorize everything along the shore so he'll know where he is, and he's finally allowed to uh, steer the ship up the Mississippi. And the, the captain says to him, you know, uh, you're also supposed to have memorized everything in the other direction. And they, she just says, I wish I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very nice. <laughs> if you ever walked in the woods, you know that when you turn around and go back, you see a whole bunch of yeah, right. it's never not, it's not because it's not actually the same trip. This has just been so fascinating. But uh, I want to make sure you have time to to get to your, your next event. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm, my time is yours. Okay. Well, thank you so much, James Scott. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Time with a Creative Mind. I hope you'll check out the other podcasts in our series and that you'll drop us a line.